Good late snowy evening, Pleasant View Baptist Church friends and family. I had my operation set up facing this direction tonight, so I just kept it here. Just got home from work. The roads are deteriorating fast. I hope to be here a little bit sooner than I was, but I got off work and just had to drive a lot slower than I intended to. Uh, I want to stay out of, the ditch, out of the ditches, right, Cameron? Cameron might sneak in here and help me a moment or two. Uh, so let's get started tonight. Romans chapter uh, chapters 5 through 8. The Epistles of Paul, this is part 7 in our studies. I told you we'd cover Paul in four parts, the Apostle Paul in four parts. So tonight we're in Romans chapters 5 through 8. And let's start off tonight with some background here of tonight's discussion. And it says, throughout the discussion in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle groups humanity into two groups. They're either in Adam or in Christ. All those outside of Christ are, of course, in Adam. They are his natural children and have inherited the sinful nature from their father, Adam, who is the root of the human tree. He was the representative of all the human race in the garden. Now, we, we like to say things like, uh, George Washington was a father of our nation. And that's true metaphorically, not true biologically and literally, but Adam is the father of, the human, of, of humankind, both metaphorically and literally, if since we all came from Adam, he is technically our father, many generations removed. And he's also metaphorically our father if we have not come to Christ. We're either in Adam or we're in Christ. So without much delay, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Cameron, you want to pick these up? Romans 5, 1 through 2, then we'll skip into verse 9. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which now we, we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? All right, let's continue on here to, I want to discuss what justification is. I know you guys have heard me preach and teach on this subject, so I'll spend a little bit of time and read the definition of justification you, you have in your in your studies tonight. Justification is not a process. I mean, the Church of Rome teaches that you become justified over a period of time. You do enough, you do good works, and you can become justified through that process. However, the Bible doesn't seem to teach that. While sanctification is a process, justification is not. Justification. It's a means that God declares to be righteous whoever believes in Christ. The act of grace by which God pardons all the believer's sins and accepts the believer as righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is credited, we spoke about that last time, credited to the believer's account. This wonderful act is known as justification by faith. Paul wrote two letters explicitly on this doctrine, the letter to the Romans and to the Galatians, with this idea he brought from the Old Testament as God led him to, to write on this subject Man is justified not by the works that he does, but by belief and trust in Christ. Believers do not become righteous uh, through faith. They are declared righteous by God. So again, we're declared righteous only as we come to Christ in faith. He justifies us. So again, first question tonight is this. What is justification and how does it relate to Christians in the context of salvation? You have to have justification to be saved because you have to believe in Christ. Well, yes, you have to believe in Christ to be saved. Right. You can't be saved unless you're justified. Yeah. And if you're not justified, you can't be saved. Yeah. Justification means that God has declared a person righteous, mm -hmm. not guilty of sin. In other words, that's a pretty cool concept, isn't it? God says a man is not guilty of sin. Not that he's innocent of sin. That's not what justification but is. he's not guilty of sin. Right. The guilt that should have been upon me, for example, my guilty verdict, what? was placed upon Christ, Christ on the cross. And so when he, he sees, declares me justified, it's not that I'm innocent, means I didn't do anything wrong. It's that I, I've trusted in one who would pay my account for me. You know, it's credited to the account. So you don't have it now. I don't have it now. I don't have the consequence of the yeah. sin now hanging over me, eternally speaking. Mm -hmm. I've been justified. And that's a good question here. Why is the word in the past tense? When Paul speaks of justification, it's not that we are being justified. Mm -hmm. Because Christ already died for us. That's right. 
justification is a one-time act. Either you've been justified or you haven't been justified. If you have not been justified, you may become justified by coming to faith in Christ. But if you have been justified, you can't be unjustified. God doesn't say, ah, he's innocent because Christ has paid his debt, and then I take that back. Or Abraham or Moses, they were to be justified, right? Yes, that's exactly right. They were justified uh, before the payment was made. We talked about it last time. The credit was to their account. Like you have a rich uncle who gives you an account, uh, sets up an account for an account for you at the uh, toy store and puts money on the, the account and you go and buy toys off a $1,000 credit line he's put on there, right? Uh, the toys are paid for because the money's on the account. Been paid for. That's kind of how the o Old Testament saints were saved. It was saved on the account that Christ would die. Now we're saved after the cross, so the debt has already been paid, which is pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, to think that there's no debt owed any longer. Uh, for those who come to faith in Christ, their their accounts are wiped clean. So it's like we can just go into a toaster and get everything for free. Right. The benefits of, of salvation have all been paid for. That's how the analogy goes. So now the word, Paul will use this word not in the current tense, a present tense, like being justified, or in a future tense, you will be justified, but it's, it's in the past tense, meaning it's a one-time Past event for those who have come to faith in Christ. You have been justified, declared not guilty. The Reformation uh, Study Bible, ESV version, says this. Paul returns to the main thrust of his analogy. Namely, there is a parallel between Adam and Christ in that condemnation and justification are the direct fruits of their actions. On the basis of the actions of one, many are constituted either sinners or righteous. Adam is the representative head as well as the physical root of all. And all sinned and fell when he sinned. Now, in contrast, by one man's obedience, it's Christ becoming obedient to the point of death, those whom Christ represents are made righteous in him. Christ is their representative head as well as the spiritual root of the new hum humanity. For through his resurrection... They're given new birth and a living hope. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way came to all people, because all sinned. Now, technically, sin entered the world first through Eve, as she's the first to become disobedient, as she eats the fruit first. Now, Adam is not some innocent bystander. He willfully takes part in this act of sin. But what Paul is saying here is he's saying that Adam is the human head, uh, the head of the human tree, right? If there's a family tree, and there is a family tree of humanity, Adam is the very root of that tree. And so Paul will, by way of analogy, um, make Adam our head, our, our, our father, so to speak. What would happen if Eve ate the fruit but Adam didn't? So they had to kick her out of the garden, but Adam stayed in the garden. That's right. Well, you, there had been no procreation, right? Probably not. They had been separated. Eve would have died a natural death at some point in, in the near future. And I suppose God could have made another Eve replacement, Eve, Eve 2.0. And then they could have went on and had babies. Because, you know, the command to be fruitful and to, to fill the earth came before the fall. So there's a sense in which they were, uh, in theory, able to produce and bear children before the fall of sin. Uh, it's just with the fall of sin, the consequence comes women, the pain in childbearing. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 3. It's not that the consequence of sin is childbearing, but the pain of childbearing. That's a very good question. We can speculate, but we know that God, before the foundations of the world, had, had ordained this, as, this, this means to the end of justifying, sending his son to justify sinners. Now, here's the question. Very, and I, I gotta have a cartoon illustration here. How did sin enter the world? Through one man. That's right. And how, how did that happen with that one man? He ate the fruit. Yep. And it could have been anything, any command of God. How trivial it may seem to us, eating a piece of fruit seems trivial. The point is it's very serious. I, mean, uh, I bet there were so many other fruits they could have eaten. Could have been. And, and there's multiple trees they could have eaten. And may have maybe lived for a long, long time before the fall into sin. But the command was, don't eat this fruit. Right? And that's the consequences. If you eat this fruit... You, sin enters the world through your disobedient act. That's what sin is. And then the consequence all come out because of that. And we went over this passage a few weeks back, how uh, this false passage, how this man thought, I think it was Kenneth 
Coleman or something, he mm -hmm. thought that Adam was a little god. Oh. Well, you can see that that's not true because he eats the fruit and God can't sin. Good observation. And Kenneth Copeland taught the uh, Adam as a little god, not just not sort of like God, but just like God. In fact, the Mormons teach a doctrine called the Adam and God doctrine. Uh, it was taught by um, you know, it was taught way back. There. I think this I'm, I'm blocking um, uh, on the on the man who first taught this within the Mormon faith, but the, not Joseph Smith, but the, his his successor. I'm blocking uh, Brigham Young. Brigham Young taught that little the Adam little God doctrine was held. And it's still have us some Mormons today. And Kenneth Copeland picks this idea. And you're right, Cameron. The fact that he, that the Adam falls into sin shows that he was not God. He couldn't resist the temptation because Christ was tempted all points as we are yet without sin. Adam drops the ball while Christ doesn't. Romans five eighteen through nineteen. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. So also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. See also through the obedience of the one man that many will be made righteous. Now Paul again is contrasting two things. The sin of Adam made everybody a sinner. And you got to say, well then does the righteous act of Christ make everyone saints? No, because some people leave this life and experience condemnation and, and die apart from Christ's saving grace. So Paul is not teaching universalism here that everyone is justified because Christ died on the cross. Again, what we're contrasting is all in Adam, all in Christ. That's the real comparison here. Everyone who is in Christ, right, is come to faith in Christ. And all that's what the word all here represents. All of those folks... Um, have been justified. That's how it's right. And all of those who are in Adam, who are outside of Christ, that's the all there, are not justified. That's the that's the two uses of the word all. You have to you have to put the word all in context, either all in Adam or all in Christ. That's what we're get working with here. Even though Paul doesn't say it in these verses. Earlier in the chapter, that's how he defines the, the two. So me and you aren't metaphorically in Adam, we're metaphorically in Christ? Yeah. The only part we have of Adam is still our fallenness is still that's and that's to be with us until our salvation is complete. And that's only complete at the glorification of the saints at the point of the resurrection. And that's still a future event. So you think of salvation as three dimensions of time. You were justified, past tense, one-time act. You are being sanctified, right? You're being made to be like Christ and how you behave and how you think and what you do. A current ongoing act. And you will someday in the future, future tense, be glorified. That is an event to happen only when Christ returns at the glorious and great uh, resurrection. One sin by our human figurehead, Adam, plunged us all into sin because we all come from Adam. One righteous act by Christ and those who come to faith in him plunge us all into justification. How did the sin of Adam affect the entire human race because whenever he sinned sin entered the world and so whenever they had children their children automatically had sin and then their children automatically had sin yeah. and then all of a sudden like this. we're born predisposed to sinning that's what we want to do that is our default setting on our computer right mm -hmm. you buy a computer and over time it you pick up a virus or you pick up programs you don't use. And sometimes it says, do you want to reset your factory settings? Maybe on a smartphone it says you want to reset. And you, oh, if you reset, you got to go back and it takes things off your phone, things you wanted in there maybe. If you didn't have pictures saved to the iCloud or something. It wipes all that stuff off and you go back to factory settings. Our default position, being born from Adam, that's who we were in at first, is being a state of sin. That's just who we are. We were born fallen and falling. When we come to Christ in faith, we are restored be, and being restored and will someday finally be restored. Romans 6, 1 through 2, and then 11, and then 14, and then 22 through 23. Again, we're getting a, a bird's eye view of flying over Romans tonight. Go ahead, Cameron, if you would. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means! We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit of your reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. Question four. What's the motivation for the Christian to live out a, to live a God of love? If we have been justified and if that's not holding over your head any longer, what is your motivation to live for Christ? Heaven. Heaven, right. Appreciation. You have been set free, become slaves for God. The result is, as you said here in the verse 22, is eternal life. Underlined there on the screen. So that is a that is a motivation to live for Christ because He has given us so much, uh, and we didn't deserve that. Romans seven six. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What is the written code? What's it referred to? Uh, our default settings of sin. Well, look on the, on the screen here. What bound us from the law, the written code? What was written that bound us? What was the thing that God gave Moses on Sinai that was written down, the written code? Oh, the Ten Commandments? That's right. The law bound us, right? We were bound or slaves to sin, and the law condemned us in doing so. Well, how does the law bind people? Uh, tie you up? Oh, drag you down? You think, oh, I have to follow those to be saved. That's right. Uh, and, and it puts upon you burdens you can't carry. Mm -hmm. The law is, is God's moral standard. It is good because God would never give you something that's not good. But it does serve a function not to save a man, but to condemn a man. To show a man where he's guilty, right? And when you're guilty of breaking the law, then you, as you're broken, then you come to Christ and find salvation forgiveness. Well, how does the Spirit set us free? What does the Spirit do? Whenever we are saved, we have eternal life through Christ our Lord, and we're set free from all those, all that sin. We're like, whenever we go into heaven, we're set free from that sin weighing us down. The penalty of sin, mm -hmm. the consequence of sin. The consequence of sin going mm -hmm. to hell and stuff. Even the yoke of the law has been broken to some degree. I think he's shaking the table. They're making the camera shake, but just to hear, just to hear there. Also, I'm gonna go ahead and wave it. All these. And <laughs> Romans seven seven. Cameron's gonna do some waving here while we're doing this live. Romans seven seven says this. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, "You shall not covet." So Paul wouldn't have known what, what sin was unless the law told him. Now, inwardly he might have known some, some sins, but what he's saying here is explicitly the law tells him what is right and what is wrong. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means! Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that the commandment, sin, might become utterly sinful. That's right. So through the commands, the Ten Commands, sin becomes more sinful. Now, I know what is right and what is wrong. Now, I'd ask you this question. If, if you find the Aborigine in, in the deep heart of the continent of Austra Australia, or find some South Pacific Islander or someone on the North Pole who never heard the gospel, would he know what is right, right and what is wrong? Yes, he would know that. Now, this camera's still shaking, so I might be very careful. I think you're shaking the table. I think, so. Yeah. You find a population who does not know, did not hear the law, he would still know what is right and what is wrong. But Paul said the law, which was a good thing, does convict men of sin. And now it becomes utterly sinful because now he has an objective uh, standard by knowing what is, you know, of righteousness. Now he knows without a doubt what is sinful. Now he becomes more aware of his sinfulness. Does it make some sense? So what? Uh, an aborigine may have known intuitively through his conscience, which was good. Paul also knew that. But when he had the law, it magnified how sinful he was. Because now his sins have been magnified because he sees them now written down. Question six. How does the Mosaic law expose sin? 
You have a guess on that one? How the law, those ten, those two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments on them, how would that expose your sins? Because you can see, oh, I've done this before. I've sinned. Yep. Is it possible to sin having never heard the law? Yeah. Absolutely. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Not knowing it was a sin doesn't make you like, innocent you know, of the sin. If you go into a different country and something like you can't steal there or something. Right. You know? It's like, oh, I didn't know you couldn't steal here. I don't or, care. That's going to be against you in court. Well, here, here's a, maybe another one. So we think a moral law is pretty easy because we know yeah. murder, covet, steal. Those are... But what about traffic laws? You go to a foreign country and their traffic laws are very different. In fact, many parts of the world, in fact, I'm thinking we're the only country in the world that drives on the right side of the road. Yeah, yeah. So ever, and I don't know why that is, right? But mm -hmm. and I, if, you, if you know that's, there's exceptions to the rule, let me know that. But let's just say that's an example. And so you go to England and you rent a car and you start to drive like you did in the good old USA. You drive the same way in merry old England, right? Well, you're going to violate all kinds of traffic laws. Now, you are ignorant, right? You don't have an English driver's license. You don't, you don't have experience driving on the roads. You don't know their laws. But I can promise you that their law enforcement will not give you the mercy that you're looking for because you didn't know. Now, what the law does, and what's moral law, obviously, it exposes your sin. It magnifies it. It says, ah, you've done all these things wrong. Here's the law, and you have no excuse. You can't wiggle out of it. Well, so again, the law made Paul become utterly sinful because it revealed his sins. Romans seven twenty one through 25a. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks to, be to God, who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. I would encourage you guys sometime, if you think you struggle with sin, read Romans chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Because in this autobiographical section of Romans, Paul lays his heart open to everyone. It talks about the good he wants to do, he doesn't do. The evil he doesn't want to do, that he keeps on doing. And he goes to this, all these verses leading up to verse 24, uh, talking about the, the sinfulness of, his, of himself, his actions. He gets to verse 24, the, the, the climax of this chapter. What a wretched man I am. He's a wretch, an utterly sinful wretch. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I think something... I think a lot of modern hymns miss out on how important it is we identify ourselves as being wretches. And re, we reword some of those lyrics of, this, of those hymns, or we write new ones to get rid of some of this wretchedness we should see in ourselves, right? We want to uh, emphasize building self-esteem in the church, and that's not what the gospel does. The gospel doesn't build self-esteem. In fact, the gospel, as Paul says, makes a wretch of a man. It exposes a man's sin. It shows how sinful, utterly sinful he is. So that, that's the first side of the coin. On the other side of the coin is the good news. And the good news is that Christ can deliver you from this. Right? Paul's hope was not in social reform. Paul's hope was not in doing better or trying harder. Paul's hope was that Christ would deliver him. Verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. That was Paul's hope. Verse, question 7. Why did Paul provide the personal disclosure regarding his struggle with sin. Why do you think Paul had to tell us how much he struggled? Well, a few reasons. Number one, we can see that in ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. we know, we do that. Oh, I see that. I know I do that. Or similar things. So we can identify with Paul. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You can see number two, oh, he did it. And he was, like, so, like, into, you know, so he wrote like he was you know and he did that so we probably do that too if a giant of the faith can struggle wow and what, yeah certainly we can struggle another reason we can see his sin and maybe learn from it and not do it as much you know try not to that's right and i think what we'd learn from this is that to cry out to god recognize our wretchedness and to cry out to god for salvation is mm -hmm. how we would use this romans 7 here very good romans 8 1 through 4 therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, 
the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might, fully, might be fully met in us, who do not live accordingly to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. All right. Question 8. How does Christ Jesus set people free from the Mosaic law and death? How, what did he do to set people free from death and condemnation? What, what did Christ do? What was his act? Because whenever we are saved, we don't, like, the sin isn't us anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? It's like, sort of, you know, you know what I mean. It's not us anymore. What, what, what was the act that Christ did that saved a man? What was his thing that he saved him? He died on the cross. Right. He took upon himself that guilt. And whenever we believe in him and we get saved... And also, we, we sin isn't us anymore. And whenever we die, we go to heaven. So death isn't us anymore either. Yeah. No, that, that's a lot like to say sin, there. Like we may still sin, but it's not the same anymore. You know what I mean? Hopefully we don't enjoy it like we used to. Yeah. <laughs> but look, look, look at the end of verse 3 there on top of the screen. He, Jesus, condemns sin, sin in, the, in the, flesh, the flesh. Meaning that he was condemned... In his earthly incarnate state, he was condemned sin in his own flesh. He took upon himself. See the previous verse? Um, last part of that, he, God did by sending his own son, bottom of the screen there, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not that Christ was sinful, but he looked like other sinful flesh. He looked like you and me, right? In the likeness of fallen people, Christ came into this world. He didn't glow when he walked. He didn't sneeze, glitter, gold, right? He looked just like anybody else that walked around him. And he became a sin offering. He was a man who was just as frail as anyone else. And he condemns sin in his own flesh. I mean, he becomes condemned while he's in the flesh. In order that, it says here, the righteous requirement of the law can be met. So, how does Christ meet the demands of the law? He keeps the law sinlessly, faultlessly, and he dies in our place. So, the second question is, how is the righteous requirement of the law met in Jesus? Because Christ becomes obedient to fulfill the law, even the sacrificial law, that brings us salvation. Romans 8, 29 through 30. For those who God foreknew, he also president, predestined, pre predestined to be confer, conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now this is called the golden chain of salvation. I'm not sure how well it comes up on the screen here, but I just took those words, those key words, and I'm trying to they link together in, in unbreakable links of the chain. Oh, it starts with foreknow. Everybody that God foreknows. Now, the word foreknow here doesn't mean just that God just generically knows people. He sees everybody in the human race. He specifically, right, knows people ahead of time, intimately, specifically, and personally. And those whom he foreknows, intimately and personally, he predestines, right, sets their destiny. He, set, he, he, he chooses. And that's part of the call. He calls a man out to be saved. Mm -hmm. And the, everybody that God calls, he justifies. Everybody that's justified will eventually be glorified. Now, it's an unbreakable golden chain of salvation. Those whom God foreknows, He predestines. Those who He predestines, He calls. Those He calls, He justifies. Those He justifies, He glorifies. Now, the only, the only future tense verb here really should be Glorify. Now, Paul uses that in the past tense because it's so certainly done that it's as though it's already been done. Now, glorification hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. So, since he predestines people, does that mean he chooses us that they will go to heaven or not? Well, in this unbreakable golden chain, what do you think here? Paul's words are, those that God foreknew, he predestines, and those he predestines, he calls. And those he calls, he justifies. Those he justifies, he glorifies. Now, if you, just wrote, if you just wrote this backwards here, start with glorified. Everybody who gets to heaven in a glorified state are Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go backwards the previous step. Everybody who gets to heaven is a become a glorified state. They were justified once, weren't they? When they, they came to Christ in faith, they were justified. 
Right? Does that make some sense so far? You can't get, be glorified unless you're first justified. Right? We're rolling this backwards here. The next back, backwards step in this link of this chain is to be called. You can't be justified till you're called. Now, we know that Paul, that, excuse me, Jesus says in John chapter 6, that, that all, Jesus says that all that come to me have been called, right? And all that have been called, uh, John chapter 6, have been drawn by the Holy Spirit. The word there is elku, right? To be drawn. It means it's forcibly to be dragged, right? Those whom God calls, He, uh, he brings to Himself through the Holy Spirit, through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Go backwards. Everybody that God calls, He is predestined. And all those who have been predestined, He foreknew. There's not one single link of this golden chain that can be broken or severed. If we literally mean those who be glorified have been justified and backwards to this chain, then that leads us to conclude that those whom God foreknows intimately will eventually be glorified. What? Abraham and Moses and people that were, you know, like saying, all those guys that were yeah. justified by faith. They were justified before they were, or they were glorified before they were justified. Well, no, because no, they've not no, been they glorified they yet. Were, yeah, they actually weren't. Never mind. Nobody's been glorified now. I think Paul yeah. uses the past tense of glorified instead of will be. Well, I think he said will be glorified here. Where were they? He said, well, he said has has also been glorified. I think because this link is unbreakable, and you can just about say it's it's a done deal because. Even though it hasn't happened yet in real time, it's as good as happened because God has ordained it to happen. What were they before they were glorified and justified? Well, none of them have been glorified yet. None of nobody will be glorified until Christ returns. Yeah. That's still a future kind of yeah. a thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, what is the order of the golden chain of salvation? It starts with four no, goes all the way through. Which comes first? Four no. Uh, which comes last? Glorified. Why? Why this order? Because a man can't be glorified until he's been justified, right? And everybody that God justifies, they all become glorified. you got a friend back there. <laughs> well, guys, that's the last slide tonight. And that's going to wrap up chapters 5 through 8. Again, I don't pretend this is an exhaustive study of Romans because we're going through all of Paul's epistles in this study. Uh, so that's where we are tonight. We'll tune in next week. We'll be in part 3 of Romans, part 7, or part 8 of the study. And uh, you guys read ahead of time in your books. I appreciate that. Uh, stay in. Stay safe. The snow is coming down fast. Expecting like four inches of snow before this thing moves out of here. So we need to pray for those folks that have to be out tonight. Those that work haven't gotten off yet. A lot of people working second shift have stuff to get home tonight. Pray they go home safely. Also pray for those folks who don't have the luxury of working from home or taking off tomorrow. Those um, emergency room physicians, EMTs, first responders, firemen, those people that have to get out, policemen. I pray that they, they can, you know, do their jobs and that things calm down. Uh, we can also pray for those that do the road clearing to get the roads cleared off quickly. And that can start at your house, right, Cameron? Can we start clearing roads? Start here and move. <laughs> there's more important roads than our dead end road, isn't there? Yeah. All right, if there's any prayer concerns we close out tonight, Cameron, any thoughts on your mind? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pray for those folks that have to be out tonight. And those trying to get home and those with COVID-19, pray for our churches. All right, let's pray. Father, come before this time. We're thankful that you allow us to study your word. Father, whether that be done remotely through Facebook Live or in person or church, we pray, I praise you for the ability to come uh, these times and to just get before you and to study your word. And we thank you for those who tune in tonight, those who are watching after this broadcast is put out there. We pray that whatever has been said tonight would encourage and strengthen the saints. Let us know that those whom God has justified, uh, there's no no uh, possibility of severing that golden chain. They will they will be at some point glorified. And we thank you, Father, for this unbreakable um, salvation which you provided for us. We, Father, we pray that we uh, close out this time tonight that you would be with be with us in the days ahead and those uh, working on the roads and those traveling tonight that you give them safe safe passage. And Father, until we get back in your house of worship, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Take care. We will see you.